sponsored by Black Magic Design, the world's highest quality products for the feature film, post and broadcast industries. Blackmagicdesign.com and by JMR Rentals. JMRNY.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend. I'm Jason Godby, and today on the program, we've got a special interview for you with filmmaker Deborah Robinson, who recently had two of her films screened at the Brooklyn Academy of Music after being restored with a little help from our good friends at New York Women in Film and Television and the Women's Film Preservation Fund. We'll have more on that story later, but first, we got some No Rest for the Weekend news. So recently on the program, Eric McClanahan and I talked about some of the features that were coming to Tribeca Film Festival, but there's so much happening at the festival this year that we have even more news for you. So the Tribeca Film Festival will run from June 5th to the 16th here in New York City. In addition to the films, there is also a lineup of television and episodic programming, along with talks, revivals, and reunion screenings. Starting with episodic projects, this year's lineup includes 11 series premieres, including the world premiere of Hulu's Mastermind, To Think Like a Killer, which is executive produced by Dakota and Elle Fanning. The series is an in-depth exploration of Dr. Ann Burgess's career and her successful journey to closing some of America's most infamous criminal cases. Hollywood Black is a docuseries about the black experience in Hollywood, featuring conversations with Issa Rae, Lena Waithe, Ryan Coogler, and Ava DuVernay. ESPN's docuseries, In the Arena, Serena Williams, explores the most pivotal and intimate moments of Serena Williams' life and career. MSNBC's The Turning Point, To Be Destroyed, follows Dave Edgers in a fiery investigation of a local school district's banning of his novel. In the series, Edgers meets with students and teachers in Rapid City, South Dakota, where his novel The Circle was pulled from shelves. Paramount Plus has a two-part special called Melissa Etheridge, I'm Not Broken. It's about the singer's bond with incarcerated women in the Topeka Correctional Facility. It's about the power of music as a conduit of empathy and healing. Etheridge will perform a short acoustic set at the Beacon Theater following the world premiere. And from the world of The Walking Dead, AMC's The Walking Dead, Daryl Dixon, The Book of Carol, will return for a second season and will screen at the festival as well. Also screening will be HBO's My Brilliant Friend, which is airing its final season. Tribeca's Now program features compelling independent episodic work, including short and long-form pilots and series. The 2024 Now Showcase focuses on several standout titles, including an untitled Tim Burton docuseries about Tim Burton's journey to excellence in melding the ominous and frightful with whimsy that's created by Tara Wood, Young Key, a story of love and life's unexpected outcomes, which is directed by award-winning filmmaker Kyle Hausman Stokes, and Juice, Mawa Rizwan's hilariously surreal BAFTA-nominated series co-starring Russell Tovey. There are a number of talks, reunions, and retrospective screenings, including live conversations with Judd Apatow, Andy Cohen, Laverne Cox, Kieran Culkin, Michael Stipe, Kerry Washington, and Gus Van Zandt, along with the world premiere of HBO's Wise Guy, David Chase, and The Sopranos. Commemorating the 25th anniversary of The Sopranos with David Chase, Terrence Winter, Edie Falco, and Michael Imperioli. There's also a 50th anniversary of Mean Streets, featuring talks with Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, the 50th anniversary of The Sugar Land Express with Steven Spielberg, and the 40th anniversary of Footloose with Kevin Bacon. Also announced is the return of Tribeca's Music Lounge at Baby's All Right in Brooklyn, featuring a rare performance by Linda Perry. We talked about her last week. There's a documentary about her. And the first ever Genesis Peorage tribute with Psychic TV and special guests. Music Lounge will run from June 6th to the 9th. For more updates on the Tribeca Film Festival, visit our website, or you can visit TribecaFilm.com. Now moving on to our featured story. If you follow the show, you may have seen our interviews with Kaveri Call and Mira Bank. 
Those filmmakers recently had their films restored with the help of the Women's Film Preservation Fund. Both of their films screened at the Museum of Modern Art at the To Save and Project Film Festival. If you haven't already, you can check out those interviews there on our YouTube channel. In April, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, filmmaker Deborah Robinson had two of her newly restored films premiere. They were restored by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and were supported by NYWIF's Women's Film Preservation Fund. The first film is a documentary from 1984 entitled I Be Dun Ben Was Is. While she was here in Brooklyn, Deborah Robinson was kind enough to stop by our studio. Here's what she had to say about the film. I didn't know anything about independent filmmaking, number one. I thought every film was Hollywood films. And I had gone to film school, and then I had dropped out of film school. And living in New York, that's where I discovered independent films. I Beat Em Ben Was Is, this is about black women in 19, early 1980, and they are comedians, and it's their story of getting into the industry and the challenges that they face as uh, black women comedians. There really weren't black women comedians in the media. And at that time, I think people probably only remember Jackie Moms Mabley. And so they talk about their, their challenges and also it is a performance piece as well. You get to see all their performances. The film features Marsha Warfield, Rhonda Hansom, Jane Galvin Lewis, and Alice Arthur. At the time, Marsha Warfield was pretty hot. She was doing a film called DC Cab, and she, she was either going to do it or just finished it. And later, we would see her on television. She was the bailiff in Night Court. And Marsha was out in LA. That's where she was working a lot, working the comedy clubs out there. Rhonda Hansom was on the East Coast here in New York, and she was working all the comedy clubs. She was also getting parts in films where she hit the cutting room floor. You never saw her, okay, but she worked. And uh, Rhonda to this day is a very, very hard worker. Alice Arthur, this is how I really got the idea for the film. She also was working the clubs, and she was a friend of mine. And when she told me she was a comedian, this was just before I moved to New York, she said, I have a surprise for you. And when I got here, she said, I'm a comedian. I decided to do comedy. And that's when I learned the routine of going to the clubs, taking a number, and uh, hoping you got on at prime time. So I, at the same time, was just beginning to shaped my idea of being a filmmaker. I decided I was going after black comedians. I looked at a lot of them and I came across Jane Galvin Lewis. And Jane Galvin Lewis, she was also an activist and very politicized. And I really loved her comedy because she had characters that really addressed a lot of social commentary that, that was going on at the time. Rhonda was out in Long Island. I don't remember the club. It's probably not even there anymore. And that was a time when male strippers were big, okay? And so she was really the comedian who opened, and it would be male strippers there. <laughs> and, and so uh, we shot at that club. Then. Um, Jane, she was at Snafu, and I don't know if Snafu is still around, but that we shot there. And then we had to go to the West Coast for Alice Arthur and um, Marsha Warfield. Marla Gibbs, who was on the Jeffersons, she owned a club out there called Marla's Memory Lane. Alice had worked there, talked to them. We were able to shoot both Alice and Marsha at uh, Marla's Memory Lane. Well, I decided to write a proposal for this film to Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Lo and behold, I got the grant and they covered the, the whole film, the whole production. So this wasn't a struggle of shooting a little bit and then having to look for money, shooting a little bit more and having to look for money. That part was very lucky, but I also had the support of other people. So a woman named Leslie Holder, she's on 
uh, my credits. And what I, she did for me was she was working at a ad agency. And after hours, as we do, we used the studio to film a performance of Rhonda Hanson. And then Al Santana, who's very well known as a cinematographer in Brooklyn, he uh, shot everything and we went to Rhonda's house. And we, we did an interview and I had been working at ABC. And so late, late at night I went to a friend there and we uh, edited the, the videotape and sent it in along with the proposal. And they were impressed. And that's how I got uh, all the funding for that. I like to edit and it gives me a chance to just go back and really look at everything that was going on in my head, basically. I think about those times a lot. And I had an editor, Terry Jones, and we were working every day in the editing room. And this is something, I think, being women, she had had children. And so there were times when they would come in there as well. And uh, that wasn't, I think, for me to be a woman, it was like, that wasn't an annoyance to me. It was like, that's okay. You know, that, that's what we're doing. It's, it, it's all of us together to get, get this uh, done. So actually, I have very fond memories of that. I remember Essence Magazine got it, and they did a, a little write-up about it, and my film was being distributed by Black Filmmakers Foundation at the time. They called me the, the next day and said, what happened? Our phones are ringing <laughs> off the hook. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, there's this article in Essence, and I mean, it was more than what they could handle, because that's what they were doing all day. They were just answering the phone about that. And so everywhere, uh, I got a lot of distribution out of that because everywhere it would go, people really responded to it. And I thought, and I think I said this, I thought that over the years, other people had probably uh, did something on the same subject in, in different ways because that's how documentary goes. I found out that no one had, and I'm like, I don't get that, you know. I don't, I don't understand why no one else uh, uh, approached the subject anymore, because it isn't like, you know, when they say things are post-racial, and you're supposed to believe that none of this is going on anymore. Well, comedians, even last night, came up to me and said, you know what, some things have changed, but this is still very relevant you know, still experiencing a lot of this. And so that's what I'm getting now, is comedians that weren't there then, if I meet them, they're, they're like, this is still totally relevant to me. Uh, just because you might see a, a few more comedians at time, or they'll have that one uh, stand up on Prime or maybe even Netflix, there's tons of them, that's it. They, they don't get any more. And, and so I'm like, yeah, this is not post-comedy for them. It's like, it's still going on. I like that it's relevant, but I would have liked for it to change. You know, I, I would like for somebody to be looking back and say, that's the way it was. That's the way it was. Not, yeah, still going through this. And I'm like, how, do, how, do, how does it stop ever? You know, how does anything ever stop? And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I have mixed feelings about that. I do. You know, I like it that people enjoy the film and see the film, but that part, that's the hard part, that to, women are still out there going through that. Her second film, Kiss Grandmama Goodbye, is the story of a 10-year-old girl growing up in an African-American community in the Midwest. Robinson spoke candidly about the film and what it meant to have her films restored. 
Kiss Grandmama Goodbye is about a black family in the Midwest in the 1960s. And this is before, I would say, desegregation of housing, when you, you really had black neighborhoods and then the old neighborhood, you know, usually the parents sent their kids to college and whatnot, and they started to economically advance. And so they would move to a newer neighborhood, but it was adjacent to the old neighborhood. So these relationships continued with neighbors and everyone that the family would grow up. This is a really a coming of age film for the little girl because she experiences death for the first time. And I look now, a lot of people, they don't take their kids to funerals. Uh, they hold it off as something you need to wait on until uh, they're an adult almost. They don't experience that. And this was at a time when you would experience, have the full experience of someone dying. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and that's where we shot. But the basis for it was a short story written by Terry McMillan. Now, the story was not expansive as the film. The story really centered around the grandmother and her friend Coots that you'll see a lot of in the film. But I was interested in expanding it so that it would, number one, show black people in the Midwest, because it always seemed like the black films were these hard urban films from New York, Chicago, living in tenements and drug scenes and whatnot. Or it would be a rural in the South and it would be living on farms and the hard time people have. I don't have anything against any of that, but I wanted more. And I still I always want more to be able to see more of our lives. And so I'm like, I grew up in the Midwest and this is how it was. In the background of the story, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the family. You're seeing the way people live, the, the homes and whatnot. You're, you, you know, you see all that. And so that is what I wanted. Also, the parents end up going to uh, NAACP conference. A lot of times we see the big stories. You know, we see Martin Luther King and all of that. Well, actually, People around the nation were working in their communities. And of course, the relationship of grandchild and a grandparent, which is different from the parent who's raising you and guiding you and uh, maybe chastising you and making you do stuff where I remember the relationship with my grandmother, she didn't do any of that. You know, we could just talk and have a, have a nice time but yet I took her guidance. My whole thing in filmmaking, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do because I don't understand why uh, it's an art. And like any other art, why you just can't do what you want to do, how you see it and whatnot. That's, that's the most I could ask of anyone that's doing an art. I think for me, is it'll end up being black people because that's my people, that's who I know. I ha do I have other friends? Yeah, but these are the stories that stay with me. These are my memories. And even though it won't be exactly things that are, are personal stories, but I veer out from that, that, that's all it is. It's just what's going on in my head and experience. Is there ever a message? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's there when I don't know it's a message. But there is, I think, a lot of times um, voices that are saying what you should do, okay? You should represent in this way. And sometimes I do that, but some, and not necessarily intentionally, but sometimes I'm probably am not representing in a, a certain way. The experience of Gail, the little girl, in Kiss Grandmama Goodbye, that could be anybody, really, okay? All the background things that I have described, that is definitely black people. And so it's, it's, a, it's a mix, it's a, it's a real mix.
his grandma goodbye didn't get as wide a uh, distribution. It is a period piece, black and white. And I wanna say, I was really, I think, influenced by Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep. That was a film I loved and I liked the way he, he did it. I like that slow pace. I like watching people just live their lives almost in, in real time. And so it, it wasn't hip hop, that, you know, that was coming in. And so it wasn't that. And so it, it wasn't as wide distribution, but I think it is very lasting. I really think the distribution now is gonna be greater for that than it was when it came out because people are tending to look for different stories and to look a little deeper. It'll uh, resonate with people even more now. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences did the restoration of both my films. When I saw the restoration for the first time, I was a bit choked up when I, I saw it because I hadn't seen it in years projected. It was almost akin to the first time I saw it projected because the whole time you're working, editing on that, um, and only people who've done this remember, editing on the uh, steam back, the, the six plate steam back with the little screen, that's how you see it. The next time you see it will be at the lab, which is a pretty decent sized screen. But when you go into a theater and see your film, it's like, this is a real film. It becomes real. And I, I never forget that feeling. So I was able to have that all over again after many years. Restoration is very important, especially if you shot 16 millimeter cause you can't show them anywhere. Unless somebody has their own little 16 millimeter projector at home, you're not gonna see that. People are not holding on to that equipment and the films aren't necessarily in good shape. I Beat Un Ben Was Is was stored better. Kiss Grandmama Goodbye was not stored as well as it should have been. So there was damage. Restoration saved it. The damage was such that it upset me. I thought, that's it, no one will ever see this film. But the technology is so good now that I can't remember where the damage was on the film. There's a lot of films out there. I mean, a lot, a lot that people have done that haven't been restored. The women were like me. They just wanted to tell the story they wanted to tell. We have diversity already. We just gotta be able to go get it. For more on Deborah Robinson and her work, follow her on Instagram at Purple Flower Films. All right, so brief announcement. I just want to let you know that No Rest for the Weekend is now part of BTRP Media Network, which is a collection of media outlets including podcasts, vodcasts, YouTube channels, and blogs, all pertaining to the entertainment industry. On the site, you'll find our other shows like Watch This Film, which is a movie recommendation podcast, and Origin Stories, which is an interview series featuring new and upcoming talent. There's also William Hammond's blog and YouTube channel, actuallypaid.com, where he reviews films and makes fun of movie trailers. Then there's two shows from creator Jackie Hansel. She was recently on the show. Her shows are Homebodies Only, where she and co-host Diane Johnson talk about HBO and Mac series, and Made with Jackie Hansel, where Jackie interviews self-made artists and entrepreneurs and talks to them about their favorite television shows. So check out btrpmedia.com for all those great shows. And that's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including our movie reviews, updates on movie releases, and more film festival coverage, visit norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube, youtube.com slash getbehindtherabbit. I'd like to thank Deborah Robinson and our sponsors, Black Magic Design and JMR Rentals, along with New York Women in Film and Television for making this episode possible. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This is the BTRP Media Network.